I'm David Griffin, it's the 19th of February 2018, and I'm here in West Ham talking to Paul Aldred. Paul, we're still going, we're still going. our fourth interview, and we've reached a point in your career where you've had a wonderful uh, run in 1999, culminating in your county cap. Um, did you still feel that there were, even at the age you were at, that there were still goals to be achieved within the game, or, or were you aware that your career... There was perhaps not that long to go in your first class career. No, I, I was always aware that it, you know, it was going to come to an end, it's particularly bowling. I, just the way I played as well, whilst I wasn't an out, an out quick bowler, but my body went through a lot with my fielding. You know, the mm. Fielding was a big part of my game. So diving around at point, landing on the foot ends and all that, it takes its toll on, on your hips yeah. a little bit and your knees. And But I was naturally lithe and fit so as long as I was still going I, I felt confident um, <clears throat> I think the, the frustrating bit was after you know that year was the following year I didn't start um, so it was like someone swiping your legs from under you again and you have to start again was that a surprise or was it <laughs> Well, Tim Munton came, yeah. um, and Welsh, Graham Welsh was here. It didn't surprise me, but I felt it was the wrong decision. Yeah. Um, but that's that's life, you know. It, it it's hard to take. I take Nada, you know, over the years. So you push yourself down, <laughs> get up. And go again. It, that's just a simple... Had you got a plan for the end of cricket? Or were you still... Um, yeah, sort of. I, 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 I was concentrating on the game. I got a little business going with someone. Didn't work out in the end that, sadly. Um, but um, but then I'd sort of... I'd never really planned ahead. You know, it was just a case of... <sighs> cricket's cricket. I'll find something. You know, and that, that was <laughs> never worried about it in the past. Why would I worry now, sort of thing? But it was just, um, if if anything, that, that's the bit that I found the hardest was while I was playing was the fact that I'd been given an opportunity in '99, I took it, and then to not be given a go again was gut wrenching. Um, you know, and. I only admit to customers coming in when you know when they're coming to get bats made and stuff. We talk about it, and I say I'm quite open about it. Is I can remember evenings sat on the sofa at midnight, tears running down your face, wondering what what the hell's happening to you. It was just a. Some people it would affect some people, it didn't it? It affected me. And when I actually look back, I've been through quite a bit in all the years I was trying to get in it. Then the stuff that I went through early on and it, it was the emotions that you go through you don't think about it at the time but at some point it's got to hit you and you go oh. but you just got to find a way of, of battling it out again so yeah it was hard but then the day, that's, that's professional sport you know and if it perhaps been at another county I might have got to go but loyalty had kept me at Derby you know and that was it on a more broader point you, you, you were captain in 1999 <coughs> um, and back in the 50s 60s 70s there was always a, a, a huge number a large number I think there was a 10 year period in the late 60s to late 70s where nine Derbyshire born players received a county cap mm. from Derbyshire uh, then there were only a couple in the 80s and then you got yours in 99 and apart from Tom Lungley in 2007, that's that, that's it from yeah. Derbyshire-born cricketers. Do, do you, just on a, a broader perspective, because obviously you've got a huge knowledge of local cricket, is that something that, that you can see a, a logical reason behind that? Are the players not there? Or do you think there were, there were other reasons um, behind that? I think there was a period where the relationship between Derbyshire Cricket Club and the leagues wasn't good. Um, I felt, and still do to a degree, that people have this inkling that league cricket <laughs> is the same as professional cricket, and it isn't. The, the facts are that you go out and 
you play club cricket and there's so many people being rightly or wrongly I won't go into that but there's so many people being paid to play club cricket now that aren't professionals or haven't been professionals it's it's a false sense of where they are because right. you you go and play club cricket you know you're going to be selected the next week right. you play Saturday if you're having a shocker I'll be right I'll have a few beers in a week it'll come good next week you go and do it for your living and you've got to pay your mortgage and that's your life and it's your heart and soul it changes mm. the whole dynamics of it changes because it starts to get up here you see I always laugh I always say cricketers go slightly loopy because day in day out they're having to deal with so many different emotions physical mental emotions and the home life as well it's it's a nightmare at times you can see why people have problems in, in cricketing life but I think the problem is that the, the leagues need people with that insight personally and because it's not about what technique they've got half the time it's about what's in here and what's up here for me and yeah, Kevin Dean once said to me that what Dean Jones taught him was how to win a game of cricket. Yeah, and he said you can't you, that you can't coach that. No, you, you either no. know how to do it. And yeah. I guess Eddie Barlow was the same. He taught to play yeah. in his area. So well, Barlow taught us how to win. Yeah, and it's not you can't read about it. Can no, you, you can't. Course to do and that. and you've got to put the yards in. And and as much as you know, I've seen people come on the staff that have got more talent in the little finger that I had running through their veins and they'd last a year, two years because they didn't have anything they perhaps relied on talent alone they didn't have anything to fall back on so when you've got league cricketers in my personal opinion if you're just a club cricketer and you're being bung money to play for a club team you're taking the money off the bloke next to you who's working all week it gives you a false identity yeah. because, you yeah, because you, you're not actually earning it because yeah. you earn it when you do it every day yeah. because it's hard. It is, it, it is truly, at times, soul-destroying. The, the lows far outweigh the high, but the highs it cancel it out mm. because they're so good. But it's just a different, it's a different stratosphere. Once, you, once you're playing league cricket, it's league cricket. Go and play against people who are better than you or at least as good as you on a day-to-day -day basis and try and get out the bad times. That's when it starts to count, yeah, I it's think. It's fascinating listening to former pros talk about how the game's played. Uh, I'm sure this will make you chuckle. Adrian Rollins said that the best advice he was given by John Morris was because Adrian was worried about, on his debut, you know, having to go out. But, and yeah. John just says, oh, it's the same as playing club cricket. There's just a few more people. <laughs> <laughs> Very typical. Of, Animal, uh, I mean, Animal would have strutted around and, yeah. and John B and Johnny would have just, he'd have loved it, you know, look at me, that's, this is what I am. Yeah. And he'd got the, he'd got the charisma talented, and the talent to do it, you know. Absolutely. Paul, um, we, we've got here um, something which, um, well, you're very familiar with when you played, but certainly you're even yeah. more familiar with I tended with to see him at Timmy for four. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've, we've had a little look in your... Uh, your uh, Factory workshop, workshop or, little workshop. Uh, yeah, um, you are a bat maker of some repute now, and I'm fascinated to know how how did you get into bat making? There can't be many professional cricketers who've who've done it, if any. No, I mean, I haven't found any anyone that's actually county contracted players that are actually physically making cricket bats. There's people involved, but pretty much like. <laughs> I always talked about it through the videos. My wife is just falling into things. And um, when I finished playing, I, I started coaching. So I set up my own coaching business and I went around clubs. And at the time, there was, there was no one else doing it. No ex pros doing what I was doing. So I was sort of booked up a year ahead with coaching and I was quite lucky. So it, it, it kept me going. Uh, but I knew it had a lifespan. So. I looked at what I, what, what I could do, what were my skills, and my life before cricket was in the building trade, um, so I'd sort of naturally got some of those skills, and people always ask me for bats, and can I repair a bat, and, and 
I thought there's something in this because it was all Asian imports coming from India, Pakistan and a lot of cheap rubbish and some good stuff, a lot of cheap stuff. But I thought, what a shame, this, is, this industry used to be, England was renowned for the quality. So while I was coaching, I basically set about doing my own apprenticeship. So I taught myself initially how to shape and then built it up and learned the whole process and so they did it in between my coaching and so it's again funny how things work out my, my little business role model was Newbury cricket bats when I was playing they were the best and uh, I thought if it could be a mini version of that I'd be happy so we say about that and everything's bespoke so you know that, that, that's sort of one of the finished sort of products so that's completely um, handmade. Completely Got handmade. Here yeah, at, at yeah, at home, yeah. And, um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll get the clefts in. I have handles made for me, but obviously we we'll splice them and, you know, fit them, press the willow, and everything's done by hand. And so it sort of just built up, and gradually it took over. So I stopped coaching. These took over. So we started doing about 300 bats a year. And then... Who do you sell to? Just the public all over the world and the professionals. Really? So they get the pros, a lot of pros coming in because they're not happy with what they're getting from the sponsors, so they come and buy them off me and then sticker them up with their own <laughs> labels. Um, and then... So, ironically, as Newby were the, 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 the sort of little business model that I had in mind when I started the classy little old, you know, old school... And about, about 14, 16 months ago now, um, phone call and Newbury got in touch with me wanting me to make all their pro bats and really? bespoke stuff. So I became their bat maker as well as still doing mine. So it sort of doubled my workload. And and now we've, you know, we've, we've made a load to go over to the ashes. And, really? and it's just, yeah, it's just gone from strength to strength and now we're getting you know a lot of, a lot of the pros are coming in and just basically they've seen other lads on the circuit with them oh can you, can you do this and, and it's just been a voyage of discovery you know and I've just learned made lots of mistakes wasted lots of money when I was learning it but it was just it's now you know I know myself we spoke about earlier, you mentioned earlier about, you know, you must have, when when things went well in 99, you must, you know, know that you've got to a point where you, you're going, well, this, this is good. And it's the same, exactly the same, no different to any other job. We got to a point where it's sort of a crossroads now, do you go mass manufactured? And I've decided, no, everything's going to remain bespoke. Yeah, yeah, and we're not going to change it. I'm always going to work from home. But it's just that the the uh, the audience is expanded to worldwide, and right. yeah, and and it's it's just uh, it's a it's just a traditional skill that it, it's it's something you don't see, and people come come to my house into the little workshop and say, oh, I didn't realise you could do it in a little place like that this, great. and um, a Derbyshire player. And a Derbyshire bat maker. It's quite yeah, Peter, I didn't know how to use one when I was playing, but because I, <laughs> I know you were still playing league cricket up to a few years ago. Yeah, but Shipley Hall, yeah. a little club. Did you use one of your own bats? Yeah, first, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just good? yeah, we did all right with them. Yeah, it's, and that, but that's how it's grown. We've never advertised. It's all everything's been word of mouth, and that's pretty much. It reminded me uh, an old an old joiner friend that I used to work with. Um, it was an old guy. He's long, long retired, but um, he used to make these beautiful bespoke windows in his in his shed. He got a six before shed in his background. He used to create these masterpieces of windows and doors. And he'd go, "I've never had to advertise in my life. It's just word of mouth." Yeah. And that always stuck with me. And it's a trade. At the end of the day, it's yeah. a trade. And something like being a brick or an electrician or whatever, it's a trade. If in my mind, if it's quality and you do a good job, people come to you. Yeah. And that's basically what we've done. And it's been ever so interesting. And it's, I've learned a lot of new things and met some 
new people through it and learn a lot about the industry, learn a lot of the comms that are there, a lot of the, you know, the things that people get away with. And that's sort of shaped what we do is, is just a real open and honest sort of business. People come in, see it done in front of their eyes and walk away with it. And it's, it's been fascinating, really. Well, it's a great success story. And I'd, I'd like to say a huge thank you to you for your contribution to this project. Um, but before we finish, I'd just like to, to, to just to get you to give me a flavour of, and, and it's come through very loud and clear during the course of the, the interviews we've done, but what, what has the game meant to you over this last 30, 40 years? Oh. Fun. Fun. Lots, lots of lows, some hideous lows in professional sport, but fundamentally fun. And that I think that's the joy of it. And you meet some great people. You meet people who you'll spend a lot of time with, who you'll choose to continue spending time with, some that you just cross paths. The thing for me now, out of cricket, is I, I do a lot of stuff with the Lord's Taverners uh, charity, and I travel around a lot with them, doing different things. I've, it's given me the opportunity to, be, to make friends with people from different walks of the entertainment industry wonderful people but spend time with the legends of the sport I used to play against and thought they were just out of my stratosphere really And but sit down with a beer and stories come out and again fun and that's that's it, it that'll be it to my dying day is the fun of talking to people and meeting new people all the time through my business, through working with charity stuff. Um, even I did a lot of stuff with the Prince's Trust when, when I was trying to find my way out of cricket. And just great stories and the, the background stories of people are fascinating. And, and that's part of it. And it wouldn't have happened without cricket. It's not a bad old game, is it? Would you do it again? Oh, I'd do it tomorrow. <laughs> if my dick hit was all right, I'd be going down for trials again, I think. <laughs> Paul Aldridge, it's been wonderful. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. Cheers.